Sean, the frenzy, well, I guess the frenzy is over. The frozen frenzy is over. What a day Tuesday was in the NHL. The frenzy is really just getting started of the NHL season. But what did you make of the frozen frenzy? 16 games on Tuesday as we now record this Wednesday afternoon. Only one, by the way, tonight. It was six hours of hockey insanity. It was awesome. It was like watching a soap opera for for sports fans, right? Like, it wasn't exactly the red zone because it has to be different because there is no red zone in hockey. My God, when players like Connor McDavid, who unfortunately didn't play, or Jack Hughes or Dylan Larkin get the puck anywhere on the ice, that's the red zone for them, right? So it was more about picking your spots, and you'd, you'd be able to talk about this a lot more. You were in the control room and got to see it firsthand. I only got to see the finished product, but it, it was literally like you were invested from the first minute until you know the end of that Philadelphia Vancou- uh, uh, Vegas game. Um, there was always something that you wanted to stay tuned for, you know, whether it was Hartman going off in the Minnesota game, was he going to get a hat trick, you know, Jack Hughes in the in the Montreal game, uh, whatever it was, there was always that one thing that you're like, I'm just going to sit on the couch for five minutes longer because I mm-hmm. want to see this. Yeah. You know what? It, it left me wanting more, surprisingly, right? I mean, you, you, ha- you had an incredible night of hockey, 16 games crunched into like, what, seven hours or whatever it was. Uh, and... and when it was over, and I was up in Bristol, Connecticut, you'd read my live blog that I kind of co-authored with Bill Price, uh, our editor, who was um, at home watching from the couch. I was in the control room. I was in the studio doing all the behind-the-scenes stuff, the reactions from the producers, what the producers were doing. We'll get into all of that. Uh, but one of the cool things about it was it left me wanting more because I thought it was so exciting and it was so, you know, like – on the edge of your seat, like, where are they going next? What are they doing next? And then when it was over, it was like, oh, it's over. You know, I hope it, I hope they do it again. I really do. I hope this is something that can get done again. And I think it will get done again. It's just a matter of when, how it will work out. This was obviously tailor made for it with staggered starts. Every game was supposed to be a staggered start until there was a power outage in downtown Columbus and they had to push that game back two hours. But regardless, every game was almost, almost every game was staggered. It was made for this. And it really was. I mean, it was unscripted. Hockey hockey is an unstructured game, so you can't have a red zone thing going because there's no team that gets into the red zone. But a team goes on the power play, bang, there was there. You know, a goal was scored, rewind, go there. If they got it live, even better. It left me wanting more, Sean. You know what I was left wanting, Dan? An interview with you. They did an interview with George Paros. They did one with Chris (laughs) King. They did one with Gary Bettman. I'm like, when is the Dan Rosen interview coming? Well, you know what? It never came. But you know what you're getting on this podcast? An interview with Nick Katsunika, our columnist at NHL.com. Yeah, that's right. He's going to talk Detroit Red Wings, who, by the way, the Red Wings seen Seattle Kraken on Tuesday night played the game of the night. And I want to go over these eight minutes that, you know, I wrote about in the live blog, but I want to go over these eight minutes that were the most exciting eight minutes for me of the night. But Nick Katsunika, our columnist, he's going to join us in a little bit. We talked to him about the Red Wings. We talked to him about the Heritage Classic, uh, the Seattle Kraken. And a little bit more. So that's coming up soon. Really, the Red Wings are a big story at the start of this season. But these eight minutes, Sean, 10.57 p.m. Eastern time to 11.05 p.m. Eastern time. You had overtime starting in Detroit, Seattle. And the last two minutes of the Anaheim-Columbus game going on, which was tied 2-2. And being in the control room for this was what an experience it was to watch the producer, the lead producer, Mark Schumann, kind of guide everything as this was happening. Like, we can't miss overtime. We can't miss overtime. So they start in a full box with Detroit and Seattle. Oh, wait, last two minutes of the game in uh, in Anaheim, tie game. Let's go double box, right? Breaking the action in Anaheim, Columbus. We're going to go full box, okay, in Detroit. Breaking the action. Well, there was never a break in the action in Detroit, Seattle, because it was overtime. So they would go toggling between this, and then you, you're you waiting. Like, what's going to happen? Is anybody going to score in Columbus? Is anybody going to score here? And through that, then you, you they caught the Jordan Eberle goal live. 
and they were able to get to overtime live in Columbus. And then they can go full box into Columbus overtime. They didn't miss anything, and it was like a dance. It really was. It was like a dance between these two games that were going on and the high drama of those two games and just watching that unfold and how the producers handle that. We always see, like you said, the finished product, right? We don't see how it's made. And to be able to witness how it's made and kind of write about it live was one of the most unique experiences I've actually had as a writer, just being able to watch it and report on this live as it's going, as everybody who was watching out there were seeing it, uh, the, the finished product. I thought it was the most exciting eight minutes of the night. Yeah, no, it was great, and I was envious that you got that opportunity. And look, shout out to John Butchergrass and, and, and Kevin Weeks. They were kind of there's no template for this, right? They kind of made their own thing out of it. I, I thought they handled it very well. There was no Octobox, Dan. No. There was a 16 box, though. They had a 16 box. It, it doesn't really count. There weren't no. action in the There weren't 16, 16 games going on at the same time. <laughs> but there was there was an opportunity for an Octobox, and it never happened. All right. Well, now you're asking for a lot here, you know? Okay. <laughs> but the, when talking with Butchergrass... Um, and and weeks in advance of this and doing a story on what their expectations were of, of what Frozen Frenzy could be, the words that kept coming up were, you know, weeks at a buffet of hockey. And it was. It was exactly. It had all the trimmings on it. A- and Butchergrass was talking about how what he loved about it was that it was unscripted and that you you you're preparing for this. You don't have notes to prepare for this. You have years of experience watching the game and, and knowing people in the game. And I thought in hearing some of the stuff that they were saying, now I didn't hear everything that they said, cause I was also in the control room listening more to them at times. Cause frankly, just, you know, that was the inside stuff that nobody else was getting. So I was in there, but it came through like these guys are hockey guys and they know a lot of stuff. And I thought it was really impressive that five and a half hours they were on, you know, and they had to toggle between all these games and their knowledge came through. It was an impressive broadcast in that sense, made even more impressive by how they actually do it. Like it, it, it really is a wild thing to watch a, a control room on a night like that. And when it was all said and done, I talked to a few people there and I was like, have you ever done anything like that? And it was like, maybe for like 10 minutes, but not for, you know, five and a half hours that they were on. And, and that's the thing. Like, and, and it was the best parts of the night too was the reactions in the control room when there was a goal scored in a game that they were in a live look in for. And it happened a bunch, way more, I think, than they thought they were going to get. Because again, you don't know when a goal is coming. You can go live to a power play, but what's that? 20% that you're going to get a goal, right? And when they would get it, like producers would like stand up and pump their fists and cheer and you know, it, it not for the goal scorer or the team, but for the television that they were creating. Yeah, no, I, I, the way I pictured it is a little bit like being an air traffic controller, right? You got all these exactly up in there yeah. and, you know, which one are you going to land? Which one are you going to keep orbiting? Um, and I don't know if it was calmer or what it was, but everybody was on the same page right the stars came out to shine last night yeah like you could have done this game and you could have had a bunch of two to one games with the you know nondescript players scoring but that's not what happened you know Ovi got his first goal Robertson got his first goal Hartman had five points and a hat trick Jack Hughes looked ridiculous like it, it was just a showcase of what makes our game great that's why you could sit for six hours and watch and not take a break like I don't think I got up during those six hours at all, because there's always something that's going to catch your eye. That's where our game is now. It is nonstop entertainment. Yeah. And the best part about this too, well, one of the, one of the parts about this that I, I really appreciated is the timing of when they did it early in the season. So every team is relevant. Every team is still in it now. Okay. You might look at the San Jose sharks and say, I mean, are they really in it? They don't have a win yet. They're rebuilding, but you know what? At this point in time, they are that game meant something. Right. And and every game meant something. Every team still has something to play for. They're not thinking about the trade deadline. They're not thinking about the number one pick in the draft. Not yet. They maybe the front offices are and whatnot, but not yet, really. And I think that's the important part of it is the timing of it. 
is that it allowed for 16 compelling games. I mean, every game had something in it that was meaningful. Is you know the outcome being the most important thing? Everybody on the night gets an A plus, except for Montgomery in Boston. Why not? Video review took away the Connor Bedard goal. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, what a moment that was. And they caught it live too. It was a it was live on the Frozen Frenzy, and they were so excited. They were they were like they were pumped in the control room. Like everybody if, was it, pumped. It was an awesome moment. Like yeah. what a goal too, right? And then offsides 30 seconds earlier like what a great catch by the Bruins staff but that is the villain role you're wearing the black hat right then that building was bonkers and all of a sudden you're like hey let's tone it down here this ain't (laughs) happening well that's how you become six and oh right I mean that's where the Bruins are right now uh we're gonna by the way we're gonna have Nick Katsunika our columnist for NHL.com he's gonna be joining us here shortly we talked a lot of Red Wings big early season storyline are the Detroit Red Wings Heritage Classic coming up Sunday at, at Commonwealth Stadium in Edmonton uh Sean you will be there for that as will Nick I will not be uh but let's let's quickly get into this right you mentioned the Bruins and Jim Montgomery taking away Connor Bedard's goal but I mean they're six and oh you got Vegas at seven and oh Colorado's six and oh in your mind right now, of those three undefeated teams who look terrific, who's the best right now? Well, I have Vegas at number one in our Super 16, so I, I, they're the best, right? They're the Stanley Cup champions. Not much has changed. They've survived being without Alex Petrangelo um, you know, for four games now. They, they just find new ways to win. There's no way they should have won that game last night, and they found a way late in, late in the game to do it, to stay undefeated. I mean, Bruce Cassidy looked disgusted with his mm-hmm. team they're six and oh right and he's like we're playing awful you know during the interview within the game to the point where they came out and and the announcers are like oh by the way his team's six and oh and they're the stanley cup champions yeah um you know but that's the culture that they have there now but i i'm just blown away by this colorado team i i think they're a really special team you know they didn't have great goaltending last night uh, they ended up getting the win but they put six up on a team that has a Vezina caliber goalie, maybe two. Their bedrock is defense, and they skated them into the ground. They did, and and here's the thing. That's why I kind of went. That's why I went with Colorado at number one in my Super 16 this week. It's so close. It's so close between Vegas and Colorado. I think Boston just trails just a little bit. Their offense is not the same as what those other teams are right now. But I went and it, and and it's a hair. It's a hair here and a hair there. So you can go either way, and I'm not going to give an argument. But I'm looking at it right now, and I looked at, all right, well, as we talk here on Wednesday, Colorado, you know, scoring a little bit more per game, 4.5 versus Vegas at 3.86. Colorado's giving up two, Vegas 1.86. It's really close. Power play for Vegas is a, for Colorado is a little bit better. Penalty kill a little bit better. Getting a few more shots on goal per game. It's close. And it's not surprise. I, so I went Colorado just because some of those stats just lean in their direction. They've also played one fewer game. So if they lose the next one, you're going to have Vegas at 7-0, and Colorado at 6-1. It makes a difference, I guess. I really don't think it does. It's not surprising, though, that these are the last two Stanley Cup champion teams. They've kept it together. They've built these teams together. There's chemistry. There's continuity. And there is a way to play for both of these teams that if you come into this team – you have to adapt to that. Nobody on this team is adapting to you. If you're new, you come in and you adapt to them, and you adapt to the way Jared Bednar and Bruce Cassidy are coaching, and that's they are the standards right now in the National Hockey League, and you can say the same about Boston. When you come in new to the team, you have to adapt to the way the Bruins culture is. You have to adapt to the way the Bruins play, Montgomery coaches, and we're seeing that. We're seeing all these new players that have come into some of these teams. Vegas doesn't really have any, but some of these, you know, Colorado and, and Boston, and they're adapting to the way these teams play, and that's that's when you know you got it good. That's when you know you got it right. Yeah, and in Colorado, Ryan Johansson, he, he's adapted, right? And yeah. he's, he's played well. And, and the one thing I will say about Colorado, if they stay healthy, they have the game breakers. It's not that Vegas doesn't. Vegas has some really good players in Jack Eichel and Mark Stone, but they're not of the caliber of Ranton and, and McCarr. Like those two players, and they McKinnon. showed it last night, they're <laughs> special, special players. Like yeah. I thought McCarr was out of his mind last night. When we talk about you know this being a night to showcase star talent, 
like every time they went to that game and it was a great game four four late and you know up and down the ice scoring and every time Colorado scored I'm like well that's it for the Islanders they can't score there's no way they get to that number and the Islanders kept doing it but my god Kale McCarr was insane yeah and it's not often the Islanders are going to score four and lose and that's what happened right I mean that's what Colorado's doing to teams Vegas doesn't allow much at all Colorado you know has allowed four in their last two games and scored 13 so you know they they allowed four against Carolina who's struggling and, and four against the Islanders and still managed to win both of those games anyway so we tease Nick uh Katsunika, our columnist from NHL.com the Red Wings Sean are, are a uh, a big story right now in the league before right before we get to Nick here though I want your quick take on the Detroit Red Wings um are they better than you thought they were going to be Yes, they're better than I thought they were going to be right now. I don't know if it's sustainable. You know, we're going to talk about this a lot with Nick. The depth scares me a little bit. Their defense still scares me a little bit. And their goaltending, right? I like Billy mm-hmm. Huso. I think he can be a number one, but he hasn't proven it yet. He can't stay healthy. So as the season goes along and I see more of that, I'll believe more. I, I, they're better than I thought they were. I thought Buffalo was going to be the best out of that group of three that we talked about, and they did beat Ottawa, the other team in that group of three last night. Um, but Detroit's run circles around both those teams right now, but can they keep it up? It's very possible that the Detroit Red Wings this year could be the New Jersey Devils of last year. It's also very possible that they're not. That's the thing. Remember, we were saying the same thing about the Devils last year, right? Like, got to see more. We got to see more. And the the Red Wings have built it in a different, somewhat different way, but they've added, like the Devils added free agents, this around, you know, core guys. It's possible that they are that team. But I agree with you. We we have to see more. Uh, Let's hear from Nick. Uh, Here's our interview with Nick Katsunika. Nick, thanks so much for jumping on with us. So I'm going to start right here. Are the Red Wings a playoff team? Well, they are right now, uh, but I'm not (laughs) getting... I'm not getting carried away yet. They were 6-2-0 and uh, to start the season and in recent years. They did make the playoffs. They were 7-1-0 and for a stretch uh, last season uh, and grabbed the second wild card in the East and then promptly fell out, right? So for right now, this is a great winning streak. It's very encouraging, uh, but there's a lot of season left. So let's, let's, let's calm down. What are they missing? Well, they're missing elite talent. Uh, but they now have Alex Dabrinkit, right? And that has changed the dynamic a bit. Like if you look at a lot of the teams that are up and coming teams or teams that have won, um, a lot of them have, you know, very high draft picks. Like you look at the Buffalo Sabres, a team that they were supposed to compete with. They have two number one picks. The New Jersey Devils have two number one picks. The Red Wings have not picked in the top three. Um, so you have to look at a different way to build. Right. And the Red Wings looked at Vegas and Seattle a bit uh, and looked at the depth that those teams, you know, were able to to gather mostly through the expansion draft. Seattle in particular, you look at Seattle last year, you know, no real superstars, uh, but they were one of the highest scoring teams in the league. So Steve Eiserman had a bunch of sa- uh, salary cap space, went out, used it on some mid tier free agents with some smart contracts, built some depth, and then he was able to get Alex to brink it on top of that to give him a little more, you know, elite talent. And now look, right. They're one of the highest scoring teams in the league or, or they're the highest scoring team in the league uh, to start the season. Um, lots of scoring depth uh, to bring it. Larkin are off the hot start. So all of that's good. So rewind a little bit. You said you want to calm down, right? Yeah. But if you're a fan of this team and it's been a long time since you've had a level of excitement or a reason for a level of excitement, you don't necessarily want to calm down, do you? You want to heart, you want to have your expectations be managed. But I think if you're a Red Wings fan, you should be jumping at the opportunity to watch this team play and excited about watching this team play. Can you do that and keep your expectations in check? Yes. Like, well, number one, I'm not a Red Wings fan, so it's no, my you're job. not. I'm saying if you are, it's my yeah. <laughs> job to bring the perspective and calm it down a bit. Right. But no, if you're a Red Wings fan, of course you enjoy this and you enjoy it as long as this lasts. Right. Whether it lasts another game or whether it lasts the whole season. It's great at Little Caesars Arena right now. There's more energy there than I've you know felt in, you know, really since the building's been open. Um, you know, they revamped some of their game presentation this year. So you got Greta Van Fleet 
uh, you know, playing before they come out. The goal song is Eminem, you know, so some good Michigan bands, some good energy, and they're playing the goal song a lot, right? And when you see Alex Debrinkit, a local kid, and Dylan Larkin, a local kid, uh, on top of the NHL scoring leaders and this team's winning, yeah, get excited. But just keep it in mind um, that it's a long year. There's been hot streaks before, and it's for now it's only a hot streak. Can they build upon it? Can they do this consistently? Um, you know, this is not sustainable, but can they uh, succeed consistently throughout the year to the level of a playoff team? I know you spent a lot of time talking to Dylan Larkin this week. Is he a different player or has Alex Dabrinkit made him a different player? I would say more the latter. I mean, I think Dylan's been an outstanding player. Like he's a good player, uh, but you add a talent like Dabrinkit, um, it just raises everything. And the puck's going in. I mean, the puck's fine in Dabrinkit right now too. Uh, he's had some puck luck. Uh, things are going in the net, right? And I think it elevates Dylan. And I think Dylan is is developing chemistry with Debrinket. It wasn't easy in camp. Like they didn't hit it off right away. Uh, Debrinket plays a little bit differently than Dylan's used to. Uh, but since the regular season started, they've started to re- to really develop chemistry, figure it out. Things are going well. Lucas Raymond's the other part of that line. He's played well. Um, you know, they ended up losing to Seattle in overtime. Uh, but Lucas Raymond hit the post seconds mm-hmm. before the overtime winner. I mean, they could have won another game, and uh, Lucas Raymond has another point there. So, uh, you know, things are going well, and um, you know, we'll see if he can continue. Debrink gets an interesting one. Obviously, we know he can score goals, and he's doing it now, Nick. But he never looked comfortable in Ottawa, It never, it, which is weird because he fit right into their age group of that team, another team that should be growing. He was coming from Chicago where we knew what they were doing. And he wasn't going to win there. He goes to Ottawa, and you expect that he'd be able to grow with that team, but he never looked comfortable. Is there something just about being in Detroit, being near home, that you think has made him comfortable? Because it's the same situation, just a different team with different players around. Well, home is a big thing, right? And I think this is a place he wanted to be. Uh, It's a place he chose to sign an extension. Uh, He knows some of these guys like he's played summer league hockey with Dylan Larkin in the offseason. Right. And they were joking like, hey, we scored a lot in that league. Of course, it translates to the NHL, Uh, you know, had a laugh about that. But (laughs) I mean, yeah, there's something to be said for being at home, being in a place you want to be. My question was, you know, he scored 41 goals twice with Chicago when he played with a guy named Patrick Kane, uh, who's a pretty good playmaker. Right. And the Red Wings didn't really have that type of player, right? As, as much as I love Dylan Larkin, he's not Patrick Kane, just different type of player. So how would that work? Well, so far it's worked great, right? So again, we'll see how it lasts over the full season, but I do think a comfort level and getting off to a good start is only going to help that, right? Like now he's really comfortable, feels good, has confidence. The team's rolling. Uh, those are all encouraging things. At some point, and you talked about it, puck luck, it's going to dry up a little bit. They're not going to score at the rate they're scoring now. They have some young defensemen. They've added some other defensemen. Is their defense a playoff caliber defense with with Maurice Sider kind of at at the forefront? I think it can be, yeah. I think there's depth there. Um, There's scoring depth there. Um, You know, Jeff Petrie's been uh, dealing with an injury. Uh, but, you know, they've got 7D, and when everybody's healthy, somebody, you know, who's got experience in the NHL is sitting. Um, so you can't have enough defensemen. Um, I do, you know, the other point that Larkin makes is they're long. They've, they're tall guys. They've got, you know, long sticks. They're difficult to play against. Um, so I think that helps. So if you go back to what I said earlier about the Seattle model, um, right now they've got four lines that can score. They've got seven defensemen. Um, their goaltending has been good. You know, I kind of s- question the signing of Reimer, um, who didn't look good in San Jose last year. He's had two really good outings. So all those things add up to what you're seeing right now. One of those is obviously Shane Gostas Bear, and, and I think it was underrated what he was able to do to kind of rebuild himself and rebuild what he wanted to be as a player when he was in Arizona. And I remember having, having a conversation with him, with him about that at the start of last season. He kind of knew he would be traded. He was traded. And here he is with the, another new start, if you will, in Detroit. But as a veteran player, 
He's got production. We know he can play. We know he can score. What else is he doing right now? Because he's got nine points in seven games at this point, but he's playing 19 and a half minutes, and it seems like he's really become a quick part of this team. Yeah, well, it's opportunity, right? So you're coming to a team that needs a player like him. You know, this you know, Detroit was 24th in goal scored last season. Needed offense, right? So that's why Steve Eisman went out to get a guy like Shane Gossespierre. Uh, he's got opportunity. He's getting power play time. He ripped one into the net uh, last night. Uh, so when you get opportunity and you're in a place that needs your skill set and they put you in a position to succeed, um, that's what you want as a player. Philly Huso showed signs last year of being a difference maker in goal, right? He had been hidden for so long in St. Louis and then injuries and sickness caught up to him. They probably overused him. I don't know that he's a 55 game goalie. I know you have some reservations about Reimer, but is this a tandem and a healthy Huso that can really make a difference? I don't know. Uh, you know, he had a great start last season, but he was inconsistent and he fell off. You know, and then the team did too. Um, but the, the the issues that you raised are the same issues that I wonder about, right? Can he sustain that level over a long season? Um, can he be a number one caliber goalie over the entire season? How many games can he play? And when he doesn't play, how good is James Reimer? Uh, if we're being honest, if you talk to the Red Wings and give them some truth serum, I don't know that James Reimer was their first choice in the offseason. Some other goalie targets uh, that they'd had in mind got away and signed elsewhere. And so they had to take a guy on a one-year, I think, $1.5 million deal who had some experience. I think they just felt comfortable that you know James Reimer's played in the league. We know what we're getting. It's a short-term commitment. Um but I'll tell you what, the first two games were very encouraging uh, to see the way he played. Ultimately, um, whoever's in net, they've got to be better as a team, right? They just got to play a better team game. And the one encouraging thing is you've seen signs of that lately. Um, so if they keep working in that direction, that'll help. All right, let's move on from the wings. We spent enough time on a team that we have to see a lot more from still, right? <laughs> um, Heritage Classics coming up. You know, and, you, and I know, Nick, you're going to that. And you got the Battle of Alberta. You've got Calgary. You've got Edmonton. The excitement, the fan bases and all that. But you may not have Connor McDavid. And you've got two teams, each with a game left, Calgary against St. Louis, Edmonton against the Rangers, who are struggling right now. Does the struggle, forget about McDavid, because he may play, we may not, but does the struggle for each of these two teams right now make this even more intriguing? I don't know about more intriguing. I mean, I certainly would love if uh, Edmonton and Calgary uh, each were undefeated <laughs> going into this game, was, right? We're battling I mean, no, for but... first place. But your point is valid in that, you know, this is a tight league. If you look at the Calgary Flames, for all the issues that Calgary had last season, the Flames missed the playoffs by two points, right? That's one win. That's one win outdoors in the Heritage Classic, you know, <laughs> potentially, right? So it's a big game. It's a division game. It's two teams that need to find it. I think when you're struggling and things aren't going well, it's good to break the monotony. It's good, even this early, right? It's good to do something mm -hmm. different, um, you know, and I think that that's, that's what this could do. Like if you're the Calgary Flames, you're going up to Edmonton with a chance to play in front of a big crowd and spoil the party in a rivalry game, mm -hmm. right? Like that's something you can embrace and look forward to instead of what's been not going well so far. And if you're Edmonton, you know, you're playing in front of a big crowd uh, in a big event. Um, it's a chance to to win a big game in front of your fans, right? And you do it without Connor. Um, I would rather see Connor there, but yeah, so you have yes. to embrace what's in front of you. It's getting late early in Edmonton, though. I, I think, you know, when we get up there, both you and I are going, and Derek Van Deest, who's, who's on our podcast recently and is, is based out of Edmonton, we're all going to feel it. The pressure's building on these players immediately, especially after all the talk going into this year about how we need to learn how to not lose games. You learn not to lose games by not giving up five goals in the third period. Yeah, like, look – it's late early all over the league. I, I think we make a little bit too much of it at times. You look at the Florida Panthers last year. Uh, they rallied to make the playoffs. They were way behind, you know, midway through the year, came back to make it. It can be done. But, man, when you dig yourself a hole, you make it really hard. And it's amazing what expectations can do. You look at Edmonton, right? They're a trendy pick uh, to make the Stanley Cup final or win the Stanley Cup. 
it changes the dynamic coming into the year. The Seattle Kraken, right, who nobody thought anything of last year. If they make the playoffs, they go to game seven in the second round, they come in this year, they struggle a little bit early, they're squeezing their stick, they're feeling the pressure. Like, it's a tight, competitive league, and if you add that layer of expectations on it uh, this early, uh, it can get difficult, right? So, um, you know, I think this is a big game for both these teams for that reason. Do you think the Oilers figure it out? Yeah, I think so, right? I I just, I look at track record, right? And they do have a track record of at least being a playoff team. They've got two of the best players, the two best players arguably in the world when healthy. Um, they're good enough on defense to make the playoffs so we can argue whether they're good enough to win the cup. Yeah, I think they figure it out. Um, it's still really early. Here's a question for you, though, with, with McDavid Hurt. Is Jack Hughes from the Devils the best player in the world right now? No, because we just talked about Alex Debrinkit. I think it's hard to uh, – when a guy's putting the puck in the net the way Alex is, I think he's – got to argue for him. I think Larkin's playing great, but I think Jack's right up there, right? And, again, you look at track record, he's been coming, right? Um, and I love to watch Jack Hughes. Uh, you can't ignore the numbers he's putting up, but he's certainly in that conversation. So you spent a lot of time – I have spent a lot of time covering the Kraken, too. You just saw them as well. Are you surprised by their relatively slow start? Granted, all things considered, it's been 15 days of a regular season so far. A little bit. Um, just coming off the year they had last year and the way the team game that they played, um, I thought they would have come into this year um, and pick it up pretty much where they left off. I think they had a bit of a challenging schedule early. If you looked at their first 10 games, uh, I think you would have thought, well, it's going to be difficult. They should at least go 500, you know, for them to be two, four, and one uh, after seven surprises me. Um, they did make some changes, right? They lost that fourth line, but you know, but you every year is different, right? You lose Tanev right off the bat to an injury. You lose, lose Burakovsky. Uh, some guys are off to slow starts, like Yanni Gord's off to a slow start offensively. Matty Beniers is off to a slow start offensively. I didn't have that, um, you know in my crystal ball. So every year is different. And the one thing about playing a team game, the way the Kraken do, right. Is when one piece doesn't sort of work, yep. everything can break down. And I think we've seen that in different ways, like, you know, little detail here, little detail there, and it sort of breaks down and you lose confidence, but it's the goal scoring. If you really, it's a rambling answer, but if you boil it down, it's the goal scoring that shocks me. They were one of the highest scoring teams in the league last year. They scored a lot in the playoffs, they had great scoring depth. And suddenly, like their first six games, five of them, they scored one goal or fewer. Like that's crazy. But you said it, right? When a piece breaks down in a team game like that, when a, they don't have a game breaker, right? They don't right. have they don't have one or two game breakers that you can just say, get them the puck and let's go. Right. right? They're hard. they're gonna take it over right now. When it breaks down, yeah. then it it can crumble around. Too. Right. It's hard for them to get outplayed and then have two like world-class players just make some plays and they win. Right. right. You know, like that's <laughs> not their model. Right. But you know, again, it's early. I think they can figure it out if they can get back to, to playing the style they played last season. I think they can get it rolling again, but you know, it, it's amazing. Like you walked in that room, like you watch Jordan Eberle after he scores the overtime winner in Detroit, watch his body language. He raises his his arms and then he's he's on his knees on the ice and he just kind of slumps. And afterwards he goes, I just thought, thank God, right? We're, <laughs> we're seven games into the season, not 70 games, right? And yeah. that's that's the pressure right now. And that's how it feels. He finally got his first goal. They finally got a win. Um, it was a crazy game. But, you know, that's kind of what makes the NHL fun right now is, is every game matters, right? It's It's every game matters. It's a competitive league. Speaking of the NHL being fun, and I know you missed a good portion of it while you were driving to the rink last night and driving home, but I'm assuming you saw a little of the Frozen Frenzy. What, what were your thoughts? Well, uh, my thought was I wish I had been home watching on TV, which is something mm -hmm. I almost never say, right? Like, I love being at the rink. That's why we do what we do. Like, I love the rink. I love being at the energy of the rink. Um, I love the crowd. I love everything about watching live hockey, but – on a night like that, where there's, you know, essentially a game every 15 minutes, like I was kind of wishing I were on my sofa with a 
with a remote control and not having to write anything, right? Like that's a lot of fun. Like there's just, there's hockey on everywhere. Um, you know, I think it was a great way to have the NHL's first 16 game day. Um, you know, and I, I kind of envy fans who could just sort of click around and watch it, enjoy it. Well, Nick, I mean, you got the game of the night at least, you know, I mean, that was the best game. The Detroit Seattle game was the best game of the night. No question about it. And, and did the energy, you touched on it a little bit before. And the last one from me, you touched on the energy at, at little Caesars arena. And I know the Red Wings lost a game, but what what was that energy like there? Because you could even see it. I was in the control room at ESPN, and I could tell the energy in that building was high. Oh, Wings fans have been waiting a long time, right? Little Caesars Arena is one of the most beautiful buildings, if not the most beautiful building in the league. Uh, the ball is made for the crowd to be intimate, to be close to the ice. Um, we've been waiting to kind of see what the potential of this building could be. And it was loud and exciting, right? Like the Red Wings, this is a game where – both teams can not like some things and both teams can like some things. And the Red Wings, they lost in overtime, but they're down 3-1 in the third, come back with three straight power play goals to take the lead, right? And the place is jumping and Eminem's pumping, right, through the PA system for the goal song. And as a Detroit guy, I just got to, you know, as a hockey fan, not a Red Wings fan, but I got a smile on my face. Like, this is what you want, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what Red Wings fans have been waiting for, and it's, it's fun to see. Great, Nick. It was fun to see, and it'll be good to see you at the Heritage Classic this weekend, and I'm sure we're going to get a great game there. It'll be a little warmer than last time uh, they played there. <laughs> yes. um, looking forward to it, and thanks for taking some time before you leave to join us. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, talk to you soon. Good stuff there, obviously, with Nick. Sean, we, we covered a lot there. And the Heritage Classic is coming up Sunday, October 29th at Commonwealth Stadium. You'll be there. Nick will be there. Should be really interesting, fun. I love the outdoor games, even though Connor McDavid may or may not play. Maybe he does. Probably does not. We'll see. Uh, a couple of other things before we go. The Philadelphia Flyers. We should talk about them a little bit. And I touched on them in the mailbag this week. Better than expected at this point. People are getting high on the Flyers. People are getting optimistic about the Flyers. Same thing was happening last year, Sean. And look where they finished. 75 points. Couldn't score. So in the mailbag this week, I was asked about them. And, you know, I don't think they're anywhere near a playoff team. I just think they're a team off to a decent start, which is what they were last year, too, at this time. Am I wrong in your opinion? No, not at all. Uh, is the Columbus Blue Jackets a, a playoff team? No, I don't think so. And they're at the same place, right? They're 3-2-1 right. and one now, both of them. <laughs> Like that's 500 hockey. That's not going to get it done. And teams are going to catch up to them, right? Like all of a sudden you see them and you see tape on them and you're like, wow, they're not as easy to play against as we thought. We got to be ready for them. And, and, you know, as that grind goes on and as the bumps and bruises start to build up on, on some of these teams that are really trying to work their way into that upper echelon, I, I think it becomes more and more difficult. Well, especially for a team like Philadelphia that's trying to work in a lot of younger players too. Like, let, let's not forget that. You know, I mean, they 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 have younger guys on defense and up front that they're trying to get in and trying to figure out who they are and what they can they can be about. The good thing for the Flyers, Sean Couturier is playing really well. Cam Atkinson, like Couturier, is back after missing last season. Carter Hart's looked really good, so maybe they're a little bit better than they were a year ago but they're not going to be that much better. They're not a playoff team. And it's, I just can't get over the fact that the same thing happened last year. I mean, they were seven, three and two through 12 games last year. And then the bottom fell out. And I kind of expect the same thing to happen, but we didn't have expectations for the flyers. Is there a team out there now that you're looking at and saying, I had high expectations. And right now that team's not delivering on them. Well, I, I think there's a bunch, right? Like you look at the Carolina Hurricanes and, and the wheels haven't fallen off, but they're not the team, you know, that you thought they would be. They're three and four after seven games. They already did a West Coast trip, you know, so you factor that in. But they're bleeding goals, yeah. right? Like they, they've they given up, what, 33 goals in seven games? They're, they're a minus five. That's not the Carolina Hurricanes. Um they need to be better. Their goaltending hasn't been good. Everybody's over a four, I think, right now. Um, you know, they haven't played that team defense that you like to see. I, I think they're going to get better, and nobody's run away from it, right? Like, 
after seven games, they have six points, but the Rangers lead the whole thing with eight points. So it's not, you're not looking at an Edmonton situation here where you have, you know, three points after seven games and right. you're looking up and there's already a pretty good gap. Um, they're right there. And, you know, once they figure it out, they're off to the races. You know, when we talked to Nick, he talked about track record and the Carolina Hurricanes have an impeccable track record and nothing's changed. There's not a reason why they should be this way. So I don't think they're going to stay this way. Brett, a hundred percent. I would be shocked if they stayed this way, you know, and, and I talked about it before with teams like Boston and Colorado and, and Vegas, when you're new there and you come into that team, you adapt to the way they play. You adapt to the way they are coached. It's that way in Carolina too. You have to adapt to Rod Brindamore's style and the, the Hurricanes culture. It's the same. They've just struggled out of the gate. They get that leeway. They get it. They, they've earned that, right? To the point where you can see them ripping off six in a row, going on a little bit of a heater and bang, they're right back where they should be. The team that I'm looking at, same division, Pittsburgh Penguins. Pittsburgh Penguins are a team that I picked to make the playoffs this year. I'm not going to go against that right now. But you look at their last few games, 4-1 to one against Dallas, 4-2 to two against St. Louis, 6-3 to three against Detroit, right? I mean, they're struggling to score. And that is an issue because I think the Pittsburgh Penguins are a team that's going to have to, at times, and we've talked about this, Sean, I think they're going to have to, at times, outscore some of their problems defensively. And if they're not able to score, well, they're going to really be in deep. And it's just a small sample size of games against some pretty good teams. But, like, they have really struggled to put the puck in the net. Their power play is at 12.5% as we talk right now. Part of that is adjusting with Eric Carlson. Part of that is Eric Carlson's adjustment. But that's a team that I'm looking at right now because if if they can't – I think they, they will find that offense, and I think they'll be able to find that balance. But if the struggle goes on for longer, you're talking about a, a loaded Eastern Conference, right? A, a div, just look at the Atlantic right now. There could be five teams that go to the playoffs. I mean, you're talking about Detroit's come up and is better than maybe we thought they were, right? We'll see. we got a lot, a lot to see here. But the Pittsburgh Penguins are a team – that has to get that offense going right now. And right now they kind of look like the rudder is a little stuck and they're a little stuck in the mud. Well, they need some contributions. They need some depth, right? Like you look at yeah. them, Brian Rust, Malkin, and Crosby have, between them they have 12 goals. The rest of the roster has five through Big problem. six games. That's ridiculous. And four of those are from forwards. Eric Carlson has the other one. He's only got four points so far in six games. Um, you know, but you know that's going to come. That part of it's going to come. But the, it's it's always been the question, right, uh, about the Penguins. They have this top end talent, and they can't figure out the bottom end. And it's supposed to be the other way, right? Everybody in the league can figure out their bottom end. That's easy to do. It's that top end that you you need to make that jump right that's what the devils needed as their players matured all of a sudden they had this top end that that could carry them through bad spurts the penguins have always had that they've never been able to figure out the back end and they've asked those top six guys just to carry way too much weight and they get bogged down with it and the other team again in that division it's i guess it's been a very disappointing division is the capitals mm -hmm. right there they they look great in the first period against the Toronto Maple Leafs and Joseph Wall kept the Maple Leafs in. But once the Maple Leafs got their footing, they were just dominant, right? Like, and the Capitals looked old and slow. And I think that's the worst thing you can be in this league. Ovechkin only has one goal. He went two games in a row without a shot on goal. That's never happened. I, is it time to be worried about him? I don't know the answer. I don't think so. He scored last night and then he missed the penalty shot, but he always misses penalty shots. I think he's two two for 13 now in his career, which is shocking for, for somebody that can score goals, but he scores them in a different way, right? It's not the fancy moves. It's give it to me in my office and I'm going to put it through you. Like you can't do that on a penalty shot. Maybe he should just skate to his office and let one rip on a penalty shot and see what happens. Um, <laughs> but they haven't been good, right? And I, and the collar's got to be getting a little tight uh, uh, on them because, again, the runway runs out fast here. They have six goals in five games. Six goals. Yeah. The San Jose Sharks have more goals. Now, granted, they've played one more game.
But the San Jose Sharks are supposed to be a team that's near the bottom of the league all season because they're in a full-on rebuild. The Washington Capitals are not. They're not in a full-on rebuild. They are trying to continue to try to win here with guys like Ovechkin and Kuznetsov and Carlson and Backstrom and Oshie. And you said it, Sean. You said it. You don't want to say it. You don't want to be the person that points it out all the time. Old and slow gets you nowhere in this league, and that's what the Washington Capitals have looked like right now. Ovechkin is 38 years old. His goal production, and I touched on this in the mailbag this week, has dropped 50 to 42. I mean, it's still incredible goal production, but as he gets older, that goal production is going to continue to drop. I still think he scores in the 30s this year. I know he's only got one right now. He's got to get guys to get him the puck. Right? I mean, that's part of it, too. They've got to be able to get him the puck in the spots where he can score. Their power plays are like 6%. They're, they're, they've scored six goals. It, they, I didn't think they were going to be a very good team. I didn't think they were going to be a playoff team this year. But my goodness, I thought they would score a little bit more than they've scored. Now, it's only five games. So they got 77 more to go. And we could be talking in two months about Ovechkin having 20 goals already. Right? I mean, it's possible. We know he can go on those runs. But they're adjusting to a new coach, and it's a group of skaters that's old and slow. I don't know that they'll be able to figure it out. I think he'll score in the 30s, though. Yeah, I I, I think he'll be okay. You can't go from 60 to zero, right? Like, there's got to be something in the middle. Yeah. So, you know, and that's that's speed, by the way, not goals. It's the comparison I was making. He's not going to go to zero goals. But, um, you know, but nobody wants to end on a sad note or a negative note, there's too much good stuff going on right in the league. So I'm going to give you my surprise team so far, the Vancouver Canucks. Pedersen's been unbelievable. They're plus eight in goal differential. Like to me, they look like a different team than they did last year. I picked them to make the playoffs. So I'm not well, you're just surprised. a super smart genius. So when we're I talking know. about good stuff to end the podcast on, let me just say that you're a super smart genius. All right, we'll see you later. Thanks a lot. I'll just end right now. <laughs> Look, I picked them to make the playoffs. I thought they were going to be good. You mentioned Pedersen. I'll bring you Quinn Hughes. Quinn Hughes has six points. He's a plus eight. He's been an even or plus player in every game. You can argue plus minus with me all you want as a, as a stat, but when you're even or plus in every game you play and your team is a plus team, you're doing your job, especially as a guy who's playing 25 minutes a night. And oh, by the way, Quinn Hughes leads the team in shots on goal as well. So we're doing MVPs in the Super 16 this week. Quinn Hughes was my MVP so far, or is my MVP so far for the Vancouver Canucks. But yes, Sean, I picked them to make the playoffs. Just pointing it out. And that makes you a super smart genius. And like I said, we're going to end on a high note. And I think that's the high note to end on is how smart you are as the host of this program. <laughs> Co-host of the program. Got a, you know, little humility goes a long way. All right. I'm just along for the ride, Dan. We all know that. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you along for the ride and all the listeners as well. And we'll do it again next week. Enjoy the hockey.